so now for the next talk, uh, we're back um, to have a look at uh, black markets uh, and the uh, cybercrime ecosystem with uh, Brian and Austin. You have the floor. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. And thank you, everyone, for coming back after the coffee break. Um, it's exciting to get this time slot because everyone's awake. Um, but hopefully, we'll try and keep it that way. So um, my name is Brian Oliver. I'm a team lead at Flashpoint, taking char charge of um, RFIs, which are client requests. And my colleague, Austin, I'll give him a chance to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Austin Tursik. I am a senior analyst at Flashpoint, focusing on uh, exploits and information stealing malware. So today, we're going to look at malware holistically, um, stealer malware in specifically. Um, so uh, yeah, stealer malware, um, info stealers also, as they're known. Um, and we'll also look at a macro view of sort of quantitative data from the largest bot shops and stealer um, malware that's being distributed. Um, so we'll start off a little bit about uh, describing the ecosystem, how it works, um, just to give a more general overview, and we'll go through that, I guess, a little bit faster, and then slow down for a little bit and talk about some of what we've learned from doing a macro analysis of the largest shops. Um, so just to give a little bit of the outline, um, we have the ecosystem as a whole, um, you know, how is Steeler Malware operating? Why is this important? Why do we care about it? Um, monetization, which is, I think, probably, um, at least for me doing the research, where the largest surprises came. Um, and I still think that's one of the most innovative areas of this field. Um, and then the trends coming from the macro data, geography, volume, all the different things you can use, um, say, as infosec analysis to help inform defense policy. Um, evolution, how these things have been changing. The, ingenuity and remarkable um, just evolution, the way that malware changes um, and is so, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but just so innovative in ways that we wouldn't even really expect and is always surprising. Um, and then finally, we'll look at some of the updates to malware, how we can pull these updates directly from um, uh, sort of release announcements on the forums and use that to explore how malware changes in the market. So to go from a update release to then look at how that affects sales all the way down the line in the chain. And then finally, a brief look at how we can use this information in mitigation. So to start off, operation and ecosystem. And I'll go through this relatively briefly since I think um, a lot of people here are already somewhat familiar with this process. Um, but we can also slow down. I'm happy to take questions at the end, of course. But in brief, um, Steeler Malware, as you can see from this chart, right, um, we start by renting an info stealer. And traditionally, this is taking place on probably XSS, Exploit, of course, as well, um, are the two main forums for renting info stealer malware. Uh, you will see it on other forums. BHF sometimes has it. Um, but primarily, it's those two forums. And they're renting out access to an executable in a panel. And once that malware is rented out, then various other threat actors distribute it, typically via mouse spam. Um, and then they exfiltrate what are known as logs from the victim computer. So they distribute the malware. Um, they get all of the logs back, either to a C2 server, or sometimes it's integrated to Telegram. Um, and then those logs are either sold to bot shops, to cloud services. We'll talk more about both. Um, or used by the threat actors themselves, um, usually to cash out either a bank account or a cryptocurrency account. Um, but that's the overall process. You rent out malware, you distribute it, you receive it, and if you receive it in large enough quantities, you resell it. If you receive it in small enough quantities, if you're a smaller independent actor, you're just looking for whatever is your specific niche, whether that's um, a bank account, a cryptocurrency account, a social media account. Um, and we'll talk more about that in monetization. Um, so why is this important, though, right? Why are we talking about this now? Um, and I think the interesting thing about this is it's really starting to replace some of the long-lived trends that we've seen in the past specifically the credential stuffing brute forcing ecosystem. Um, and I use those two terms interchangeably, even though they're not the same thing. Um, and we can get into brute forces. They're fascinating tools as well. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, because threat actors refer to them both as brutes, um, credential stuffers, brute forcers will use the two terms interchangeably. And the way that this used to work is raid forums, which of course has recently gone down. But um, there are other forums as well, nulled, um, various other ones that sell or just make freely available on these large username password databases. Um, so you acquire a database, it costs usually around $4 on RAID, I think was the going rate, um, for something that can be anywhere from a few thousand to a few million lines of plain text email and password. 
You load that into a credential stuffer, usually it's open bullet because you can get it on GitHub, um, but you know, Woxy, Private Keeper, you know, you have your whole choice of these things. Um, and then you can spray those combos against any website you want, right? Um, if you know, people who use the free streaming to try and bypass you know, Netflix or um, other Hulu, other streaming platforms, oftentimes it's coming from those um, accounts which are gained through credential stuffing. Um, bank accounts, same sort of thing. So that's traditionally how this has worked, right? You buy the username and password, you spray it against 100 different sites, you check the ones that are valid, and then you either monetize those or resell them. But that is changing. Um, we'll look at some numbers that prove that as well. And as much as this is going to remain, a very important part of the criminal ecosystem because red credential stuffing tools are really low bar, low barrier to entry. Um, they're basically no code automation platforms. You don't have to you know, understand any code to write uh, the, the attacks that are being used. They're still not as effective and not nearly as um, workable and cheap as bot shops are. Um, so what's changing, right? Instead of databases, now it's Steeler malware. Um, and what you're getting is so much more effective and so much more interesting than just a simple username password combo. And this is coming from the protections that you know, banks and other organizations have put in place to um, prevent these sort of attacks, right? Now we have stuff like two-factor authentication that triggers if you're coming from an IP address in a different area, something that's going to check your cookies or your browser history or you know, all these different sort of fingerprint um, data points, even down to biometrics and the way a mouse moves. And all of this can be emulated through the information that you get from Steeler malware by putting it into anti-detect browsers. So rather than buying a username and a password, you buy a log or a bot, as they're known interchangeably, and you get everything about a victim's computer from, you know, again, the exact points we were talking about, and you can load that up into an anti-detect browser and become that victim. So if, for example, your bank, as my bank does, and many banks do, only allows two-factor authentication if you're coming from say, an IP address in a different location and a different browser, if you have a victim's logs, you're emulating that victim's device, um, all of their hardware information, even down to their screen size, and you put in a SOX proxy, often that's coming from botnets, you know, some of the things that we've been hearing about earlier today, um, and you can come out of a, you know, an IP that's you know, within just a few miles of that victim. So then you are bypassing two-factor authentication and other browser protocols put in place that would be triggered by a brute forcer. Um, and I'm happy to delve a little bit more into that, but I want to move on from that sort of basic um, explanation. The key takeaway, though, is an email and a password is not often enough to get into um, a system anymore. So now that's why we're seeing, I think, the really rapid evolution of Steeler malware. Um, and I promised some stats to prove this point, right? So this is 38 account shops, that's the orange lines, um, or the orange line, sorry. And five major bot shops over the last three years. Um, and you can see, uh, right, it's not that Steeler Malware in the numbers has replaced the volume of listings on account shops as a whole, but they are certainly trending toward replacement in that area, right? I mean, you can see, you know, part of this has been somewhat affected by, like, SlipPP went down, that was a major um, account shop and several others. But removing any one or even a couple of those account shops that have gone offline in that time period does not affect the overall trend. Um, because it's, again, it's just not as profitable anymore to resell these individual accounts when you can get so much more from a log. So I think we are starting to see um, Steeler Malware and specifically the bot shops replacing the traditional account shops, BlackPass, another one, um, and several others. Um, so how does it work, right? When I say replacing, where are these things going? So uh, essentially it boils down to three different areas that Steeler Malware is sold. Um, Either it's used by the malware developers itself or themselves, so not really sold, rather, right? As I was talking about earlier, you rent it, you distribute it, and you use it. So that's the first thing, and that corresponds to that third bullet point there. Malware developers, they just use it themselves. And then the other two ways are bot shops, this stuff like Genesis, Russian Market, you know, what we were talking about, where you purchase it, you purchase an individual machine, um, or cloud providers, which I think are largely overlooked now, but becoming a larger and larger trend, where Threat actors will sell bulk access to, say, a Redline stealer, right? A threat actor or a group of threat actors is running Redline, and they'll say, okay, for $1,000 a month, they're not cheap, a um, thousand even would be relatively cheap for some of them, you'll gain access to a historical pool of one million infected devices, and you'll get a new, um, say, 2,000 or 3,000 every week or every month. Um, the caveat is you have to share that with the threat actor. But right, um, this is another reason that uh, malware is replacing um, credentials. 
um, you get all of the victim's credentials when you get malware, right? So if I go to an account shop and I buy, say, a Facebook account, that's all I get. But if I get Steeler malware, I get the Facebook account, I get the bank account, I get everything down, 30, 40 different logins that are saved in that browser. So if I sell that as a malware cloud, one person can use it for social media, another person can use it for the bank, another person can use it for crypto. Um, so that's what makes it profitable. The same victim can be used again and again and again. And again, just to reiterate that point I made earlier, um, you know, the, the reason these are, that malware is replacing uh, credential stealers is because of the volume of information you get and the security protocols that it allows you to bypass. Um, so, bot shops, right? There are essentially three right now. Um, I have four because when we made this presentation and a lot of our data came from it, Amigo's market was still online. Um, that went offline, gosh, it would have been a couple months ago at this point, um, relatively recent development, but now there are three. Um, it changes relatively rapidly, but today it's Genesis, which is uh, effectively the oldest and certainly the most complex. Um, Russian market, which has the highest volumes right now and is probably the most well-known. Um, Amigos, which is of course offline, but we'll talk about later, and Too Easy, which is a new addition to malware. They've always done other, um, they've engaged in different kinds of fraud, but they are relatively new to the malware scene. Um, and then you have some other players like Ross Logs, which has been around for years at this point. Um, they run and distribute their own malware, so they're a smaller operation, but still effective. Uh, Mouse Inbox, which uh, was um, again, one of the earlier malware systems, that's also gone offline now, but I think it was one that security professionals certainly liked because they exposed the full IP of victims, so it made mitigation very easy uh, prior to purchase. Um, and then, then other smaller players like Top CC World. This list isn't exhaustive by any means, it's just a couple of the shops that we are tracking right now. Um, so that's shops, these are cloud providers. Cloud providers, really fast turnaround, they don't last all that long. Um, right, I mean, you look at how marketplaces, you know, there's usually an exit scam at some point. Same kind of thing with cloud providers. You can get malware um, very reliably for several months and then all of a sudden they disappear, maybe because they stopped distributing the malware or they lost access to their, you know, C2 server or they just didn't want to continue. Um, so much so that every single one of these pictures comes from a malware cloud provider that is no longer online, with the exception of Ross Cloud, which is tied to Ross Logs. Um, but numerous cloud providers, right, they come up, they come down, they're largely on BHF, um, you'll see plenty of them. There's probably a lot of overlap between them just because of the volume they're operating. Um, but again, this might last for a year, it might last for a week, um, it might be repackaged, but these are the bulk sort of ways that you can access these things. And then finally, as I talked about earlier, malware distributors, right, people who just use it themselves. Um, so we'll talk just briefly about what it looks like to buy and rent malware, right? You go to XSS or Exploit, or again, several other forums. Um, you have a few options to choose from. You have to decide, you know, do I wanna set up a panel myself? Um, do I wanna host it? Uh, do I just wanna use another threat actors panel? If I really don't understand what I'm doing, do I want them to set it up for me? Will I pay extra, inf uh, extra money for that? Um, and I can just get logs received right to my Telegram account on my phone, um, you know, which a lot of threat actors do. It depends how conscious you are in OPSEC and you know where you are, where you're located in the world. Um, how concerned you are that someone's gonna come, out, come after you. Um, but it's essentially, it's a free market ecosystem where people are competing and they're always adding new updates, new functionality, new customer service. Uh, Raccoon Stealer, while it was online, had 24 hour customer service spread across accounts in different time zones so that you could always get the support you need. Um, you know, different things to try and grab customers from each other. Um, again, right, depending on how you wanna host things on panels. But you find something you like on these forums, you reach out, usually over Telegram, um, can be Jabber or other encrypted messengers, um, and then you'll pay, it'll be something like maybe $30 a month to rent a panel, um, all the way up to you know, maybe a couple hundred, depending on what you're getting. Um, but then you might also get access to a closed chat. So like one of the stealers that we've gained access to, we've seen within closed communications, they will trade the logs with each other, right? I'm you know, very interested in these logs, but I don't want these, so I'll, trade all of the ones that I've acquired for all of the ones that you've acquired for different domains. Um, so we are seeing a lot of Steeler reuse. And to provide some context, this is the panel for a bloody Steeler. Um, I just find sometimes dark web art is most, among the most interesting. Um, but to also highlight the, the weird nature of the people that we're dealing with, uh, bloody Steeler shut down, um, at this point probably almost a year ago, it's been a while. Um, but the last message they left, uh, for those of you who can read Russian, essentially they said that, um, and, and later I turned, it turned out, I think this person was about 17 years old, but their mom had got them studying until three in the morning um, and had finally gotten fed up and taken their computer away, so the malware had to shut down. 
Um, but it's just interesting to remember that we are dealing with real people sometimes and the, the concerns that come in with that. So monetization though, right? So we know why this is happening. We know why it's starting to replace these things, but how do threat actors cash these out? And it's not always so simple as, well, they go, they log into the bank account, and they drain the bank account. I mean, that is a lot of it. Um, but this is, again, why I was talking about the ingenuity that comes behind some of this malware um, and the ways that threat actors can cash things out. Um, one, of the way, or one of the reasons that malware offers so many different opportunities to threat actors is the fact that it is persistent. So this screenshot on the far, for you, it will be, yes, the right, same as for me. Um, this is from Genesis. This is from one of their updates. Those uh, red arrows and that updated, those are their markings, not mine. Um, and what they show is if you buy a bot from a victim computer, the malware doesn't disappear from that computer, right? So maybe a month, maybe a day later, I get an update. Hey, this person has changed the password on their bank account. Or hey, this person opened a cryptocurrency account. Here are their credentials. You can use them to log in. So it's not enough just that I've purchased and have started to drain the accounts of this victim. I can use this victim on a recurring basis. You know, maybe I've drained their bank account. Um, they very frustrated. They set up an account with a new bank. They transfer, you know, whatever money they have. Their new paycheck comes in. Drain it right again. The victim doesn't have any indication that anything is wrong unless they understand that they've been infected with malware and need to make some changes. And unfortunately, because of the nature of malware and that it's distributed across um, users who aren't so tech savvy, this is a problem, right? Um, and it just opens up those new opportunities. So um, how is it monetized, right? Other than bank accounts. Credit cards, of course. The stealers often will specifically grab credit cards that are st stored in the browser. Um, social media, which we'll talk about. Cryptocurrency, which we'll talk about in depth as well, and unauthorized access, of course, right? Buzzword, ransomware. Um, of course, this is you know, one of the threat vectors that can be important in ransomware and with corporate access, because as we'll see, you can really um, narrow down what sort of victim you're looking for. Um, so first looking at cashing out, right? So Russian market, um, and I think Amigos was this way as well, um, and I believe also too easy. Uh, cryptocurrency, it's so easy to cash out, they're not even going to give you the opportunity. Um, Russian market logs and the other bot shops are pretty cheap. Um, they're usually between 10 and $3, and the reason for that is the best resources have been cashed out already. So you'll often see the cryptocurrency accounts have already been drained. However, Genesis, which does command a premium, premium on price, does not do that by and large. Um, so that orange line down there that's much higher than that purple line, that is the average price per week over time since um, December of 2021, oh no, sorry, I've, yeah, I'm looking at that backwards, sorry, since 2020 to 2021. Um, and the higher orange line that shows prices hovering between 60 and 100, that is the price of logs that had common cryptocurrency wallet domains included in them. Um, so logs that can be assumed to contain some sort of cryptocurrency resource. Um, and then the purple line is all other listings over the same time. So obviously this is a major point for threat actors. Cryptocurrency is very much in demand. Um, and it's, you know, it's, again, it's just a very easy, simple way to start cashing out these resources. Um, you'll see similar trends with logs that contain PayPal, AliExpress, different things. But in, by and large, the easier it is to cash out a resource, the more expensive that bot is going to be on bots that don't already cash it out before they offer it to you. Number two, social media, and I think this is among the most interesting. Um, what you see at the bottom, that's the panel from Snowflake Stealer, and then what you see in the right is Dolphin Tool. Um, I don't know how familiar everyone is with social media fraud, but I'll just delve into it a little bit. Essentially, social media accounts are almost as valuable, if not more so, than bank accounts, because you can make more money with them. Um, Dolphin, which is this tool on the right, Similar to other tools, like uh, there are several others, Sock Robotic, FB Tool, um, basically tools that allow you to manipulate hundreds or thousands of social media accounts via the API to run advertising campaigns. Now, um, these social media companies are obviously very good and in, in some ways very effective, especially on the browser level, at blocking these sorts of advertising campaigns. But if you have a steady stream of 2,000 new logs coming in in a week, and they're coming in with credit cards that you can use to launch those advertising campaigns, that's a really good source of revenue, right? And then when you combine that with cloaking tools, um, which allow you to advertise things like gambling or drugs or other illegal activity on social media platforms that ban that sort of activity, now you have the targeted power of social media that allows you to get a database of 
say, users that are likely to be at risk of gambling, run targeted ads to them that advertise gambling platforms on a pay-per-click basis, use the victim's credit card to pay for it, and reap all the profits from that. And we've seen just really incredible um, returns on investment from that. Um, because this isn't technically legal, depending on what you're doing, there are some shadow ecosystems, especially in Eastern Europe, um, where you know, they have physical offices, they're running really complex business software, um, and you can see returns of thousands or even hundreds of thousand dollars a month doing this sort of thing. Um, it's very much driving the malware ecosystem in this way. Um, and then finally, of course, unauthorized access. Um, this is the search panel from Russian Market on the top and from Genesis on the bottom. Um, you can search by whatever you want. So let's say you are a ransomware provider and you're interested in, say, corporate access. Search for subdomains with Slack, with Citrix, SSO, Okta, right? Anything that's gonna gain you access to a corporate domain. And if that corporate domain doesn't have, say, a bank account on it, might be really cheap, might be three or four dollars. So you can get something really valuable here for really cheap, especially if you can get in and then move laterally or extend that access and then sell that to a ransomware provider for three or four times the profit. Um, Genesis Market has been, has been reported as the initial vector in the EA Games, leech for, games leak for Slack access. Um, so, you know, certainly a very real threat. Um, but yeah, this is, again, obviously another way to monetize these sorts of logs. Um, so that's a little bit about monetization. And then finally, before I turn things over to Austin, I'll talk about the trends we're seeing on the macro level. Um, so, large chart, that's Genesis, <clears throat> and then the small charts, that is Russian Market and Amigos. Um, Russian Market and Amigos, almost identical, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about why. Um, but one thing that is interesting in these bot shops is that all of the bot shops we looked at, and Too Easy has um, statistics I couldn't figure, or I couldn't uh, fit it on this slide without making it what I assumed to be unreadable. In fact, it might already be unreadable, so I apologize for that. Um, but Too Easy is very much in line with Russian Market and Amigos. And what you're seeing is the highest volume is orange and the lowest volume is black. Um, pink is sort of in the middle. Um, and what you're seeing is that the countries with the highest population have the highest infected victims. No surprise there. Um, but again, Genesis, um, when we look at that, again, a premium market, sort of the opposite trend. The top 10 impacted countries on Genesis market are all either European Union or the United States. Um, Italy, France, both feature especially high on Genesis. So again, the threat actors are commanding a higher price and they're offering a premium in that um, a user from the European Union is likely to have a bank account in there with more, um, you know, with a higher amount than a user from, say, a higher population country like India. Um, and then looking at price, right? I've talked a little bit, or I've talked consistently about Genesis being higher in price. Genesis is that black line that starts up on the top. Um, we have seen some sort of um, you know, coming together of the lines and as they sort of compete with one another. The reason the pink line stops, which is Amigos, is Amigos going offline. Um, and you can also see the historic average price in there. Um, but again, what you pay for is what you get. Too Easy is considerably cheaper, and you're also getting the least information when you buy the log. You don't know what the stealer is. Um, you don't necessarily know how reliable it is. There's not very good customer service. In fact, you're lucky if you can get the site to resolve at all on your first try. Um, so because of that, you're paying three or four dollars a log. Um, you want something much more complex like Genesis, which comes with a built-in anti-detect browser, you're willing to pay a premium for it. Um, so again, it depends on what you want, and it also depends on how sophisticated a threat actor you are. Because with that built-in anti-detect browser from Genesis, if you know how to purchase a SOX proxy, you can effectively use an anti-detect browser because it's all built into the store. Um, Stealer type and volume, this is from January 2021 to April 2022. Uh, red line has really been dominant. And we'll talk a little bit more about why, perhaps in the, um, as we go on. Uh, Amigos here, really accounting for the largest number of shops. That number is a little misleading, and again, I'll talk why on the next slide. But um, I do think it's interesting, um, and I should note that this breakdown of red line, Vidar, Raccoon, all the different stealer types comes exclusively from Russian market and Amigos, because they are the only ones that give a stealer type in the listing. Um, but I do think these sort of things can be interesting, especially when we look over time for resource allocation. If you understand where the stealers are coming from, or which ones are being sold the most often, which ones are being the most rapidly developed, right? Um, which ones present the greatest threat to your organization, then you can look at that stealer, you can look at how it's developing, and you can try and put mitigation in place. 
Um, and then finally, overlap, which was another interesting trend that we looked at. Now, when we first started doing this research, um, this wasn't public knowledge that Russian market and Amigos were reselling the same logs. Um, now it's been sort of more or less widely reported, and again, with Amigos going offline, it's less impactful. But you can see using the in original infection date of the log as a proxy, um, those two pink lines at the top moving together on a basic one-to-one -one ratio. Um, for a while, every log on Amigos and Russian market coming out was the same. And there was some back-end collaboration, because we ran some tests where if you purchase a log on one, it disappears from the other, and vice versa. Um, and this was, once that was publicly reported, um, then shortly after that, Amigos went down. Um, I'm not sure if that's related. I don't have that information to say, but I do think it was interesting that it seemed as though they were trying to make as much money as they could from Amigos before things um, before eventually just sort of exiting. Um, I think about a month before Amigos went offline, they started charging a $350 application fee. It used to be free. Um, but again, interesting, right? Um, and you can see sort of the overlap between shops. Russian Market and Genesis, we're looking at around 1%, 1 1.5 for Amigos and Genesis. These are probably victims that were infected by different threat actors and just happened to be extremely unlucky and get their information on both shops. And in fact, you will see this, right? Like Russian Market, has um, numerous sellers that they resell on behalf of. Um, and you'll see the same victim IP up there infected by Vidar, Redline, and Raccoon, um, people with extremely poor online habits um, who've been infected and resold numerous times. But again, then that 46% overlap between Russian market and Amigos um, indicating, right, and that partially explains why the numbers were so large earlier for Russian market and Amigos, um, just indicating um, obviously a lot of overlap and collaboration there. And then finally, that is all it for my end, so I'll turn it over to Austin to talk about how these stealers have evolved over time um, and the sort of tactics and trends that we're seeing, and then also a little bit about how we can use that data in defense. So thanks very much. All right, so let's talk about the evolution of a lot of the tools that threat actors are using. Um, so the way in which threat actors have been committing fraud has continually updated as well as their tool sets. So uh, the, the combinations of tools that these threat actors use widely range uh, based on what they're targeting and how they're targeting it, right? Used to be that they could just use the brute forcers, but now they're having to use these combinations of anti-detect browsers, proxies, and various cash out techniques and you know, uh, techniques that target directly uh, individual marketplaces. As you kind of see when you go through a lot of these markets, uh, and forums is that methods are at times very targeted. The method you may use to uh, empty one crypto wallet through a platform may widely vary and differ from another market. Um, and the threat actors creating the tools used by the threat actors committing the fraud have also continued to adapt. Uh, as we'll see in like uh, Genesis's uh, browser and tool sets, uh, they have continually added new data points that the systems are capable of uh, emulating. They add these new data sets, they add these new data points, where again, we just had the original username and password, we're now going to look at things such as username, password, the amount of RAM, battery left, the fonts downloaded, the graphic card, all of these different data points are become incredibly important and have to be developed from uh, the threat actor standpoint when developing these browsers and these anti-detect tools. Similarly, they need malware that can provide them. It's of no use to a threat actor to develop a uh, graphics card emulation component but not have a malware that can feed it. So many of these mal ma uh, malware developers within kind of the open uh, forums and markets as well as some of the more private markets have all made changes to adapt to these circumstances. Uh, and then again, the, the data as Brian has talked about uh, has continually to, uh, continued to evolve. You should just be, you know, the username and passwords, but now we're getting to these points where you are getting these full digital fingerprints such that you can become somebody online. So let's talk a little bit about the anti-detect browsers and what they do. So the original purpose behind an anti-detect browser was really geared towards privacy. The idea was I could go through and I could change my user agents, I could change uh, how my system responded, I could change how I looked so that uh, various sites, trackers, that kind of stuff couldn't follow me around the internet. Um, and what was really nice about these is you could create uh, your own profiles and whatnot to better blend in and create whatever you wanted. So if you were trying to appear as if you were coming from, say, Canada, you could set up a system that looked like it was coming from Canada. 
Um, threat actors, however, realize this, of course, has a lot of use in their perspective because uh, when trying to cash out of a Bank of America account, uh, connections coming from Russian systems generally doesn't look too kosher. So we have these systems that really take part in this. Genesis is one of these really great examples in that they have both their Genesis browser and a Genesis plugin that you can install in any Chromium browser. Um, you know, while some of these browsers will operate as just simple imports where you load in an XML file, Genesis is incredibly powerful in that it will take uh, a Genesis account directly bought on the market and automatically import it, literally to the point where if you open the browser and you provide the necessary authentication information to access your Genesis account, you can just pick the bot you want and then from there import a proxy and that's it. The technical requirements for performing these types of configurations has gone from relatively sophisticated to as simple as a drag and drop, click and play. Um, and looking at the growth of a lot of the discussion around these, malware that, is, that has been targeting these more advanced features, you know, these, these digital fingerprints has widely increased since uh, 2016. We can kind of follow through and uh, this graph shows the discussion and the relative discussion across a number of forums where these malware are being discussed. So one of the early ones that was very popular was uh, Azeroth. Uh, and you can see Azeroth maintained at least some presence uh, up until around 2019. Um, at that point, I believe the developer decided they uh, were going to stop development. There were some vulnerabilities which impacted the malware and really kind of hurt a lot of the uh, public trust in the malware. Um, but you also see other new families coming up like Vidar, which has remained relevant. Uh, since its initial uh, introduction. Uh, and more recently, we can see a lot of references to the Redline uh, and Glade uh, starting in Q1 of 2020. Redline has maintained its position within the steel market as a uh, high tier stealer that's both effective and regularly maintained and updated. And because of that, you know, you have a lot more mentions of it. You have a lot more public uh, presence for it. And then looking at the functionality of these, right, when, when I talked about the Genesis plugin, at this point, uh, and this may actually be dated since, since we put it through, um, it can generate at least 36 different points. And that goes from everything as simple as like user agent and cookies, um, but it also includes things such as uh, unique fingerprints, audio, uh, battery limits, the CPU cores, fonts installed, all of this information which a site may use to try to validate an account, this provides threat actors with an ability to maintain and pretend to be that. And modern stealers now have begun to provide that necessary information. So you can see on um, the right, the larger one is an example of a raccoon uh, stealer log. You can see, it's actually very interesting because you can see the exact version that it came out on. You can see when the malware was ran. You can see the bot ID. And looking through, you can see some basic stats on the system. Um, but also, we get an IP. We get a location. We know that um, you know, it gives us a latitude and longitude. It gives us the computer name. It gives us the username. All of this information comes through incredibly useful when imported into these other tools because it gives us everything we need to better create uh, our victim. Same thing with um, looking at the smaller image. That is a full dump of the information that's included. You can see there's a passwords.log under the Google Chrome uh, browser, but there's also a lot of other interesting information. There's the keywords, there's a list of the downloads, there's a list of the cookies, and there's a list of the autofill data. All of that information is incredibly important because it helps us to better mimic a, a user. Um, and on top of that, we see other information such as um, logs stolen from Steam, uh, screenshots and then like a, file, a FileZilla dump um, from likely some type of FTP. Again, all of this information can make it in some way into any of these platforms and be sold and all of that information can help a threat actor commit more advanced fraud uh, against very targeted organizations and targeted um, systems. Another area where we've seen a lot of growth and change is kind of the distribution. Um, so there's really a couple different ways that threat actors can do this. Um, very hands-on approach in which the threat actors uh, self-distribute. This is important to remember with groups like Raccoon and Vidar where they provide you with the stealer. The role of the threat actor in that case is just to distribute it. So in some cases, they may have a very robust spam network. They may have a very robust environment where they can spread their stealer. They can do that um, on their own. They can also go around and spread it on common sites. Uh, we'll see a lot of malware actually on these hacker forums, specifically low and mid-tier forums, where somebody will create a cracked version of something, uh, and when they run it, it's actually an info stealer that will steal all of the threat actor's information. It's always ironic when you see a criminal's uh, logs in these data dumps. 
but there are also other services kind of more ideal for these hands-off actors. So uh, Install Shop uh, was, is no longer active, but it was a shop uh, run by a specific threat actor on, it was Exploit? Mm -hmm. On Exploit, so a high tier uh, forum. And this shop did nothing but spread your malware. Now, the problem with this, of course, is when they're spreading the malware themselves, you don't really know where it's gonna go. But from a threat actor's perspective, it does allow you to take kind of a hands-off approach, right? Especially if you're using something Raccoon, and Vid like Raccoon or Vidar, you can begin spreading your malware with very little effort. All you have to do is log into your platform of choice, take the build that they gave you, and pass it to this, uh, this uh, distributor, who will then distribute it, and your logs will appear on your uh, panel. Um, the P individuals who operate and um, provide this service are limited, because uh, it is a difficult service to provide, but it is available there for threat actors who don't necessarily want to provide their own services and perform their own um, spreading. So another thing we want to talk about is the malware updates uh, and notable events that impact this. Uh, given the ability for us to track some of the malware uh, log numbers on these various sites, we're curious to see if there is any type of uh, relationship between the updates and the volumes we are observing. So a quick little overview about how uh, updates are handled. Some maintain active updates within the public forums. Uh, that they operate in, and uh, this is gonna include things like Raccoon, Taurus, and Redline. Generally, these threat actors are going to go into uh, mid and high tier forums where they're selling their malware, and they're going to provide regular updates about the malware. Uh, information provided in these updates varies. Sometimes it may be as simple as small bug fix. Sometimes it may be as, as uh, in depth as you know bug fixes relating to new browsers, yada, 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 and it provides a lot of in-depth information. Other operators don't necessarily provide this publicly, so Vidar is one of those. Vidar, for a very short time, provided updates on a public forum, but they then chose to re release all of their updates via their, uh, their single sign-on platform that they leverage. Um, Ficker is another one you can kind of see here. There's a limited number of logs, and they provided two updates that really didn't correlate with any logs. Pros and cons for both approaches to providing updates. Um, when you provide your updates publicly, it lets threat actors know that you're continuing, continuing to develop your malware and, and continuing to support new changes. So if an issue comes up and all of a sudden uh, AV systems are detecting your malware because of an operation, well, I can look through your past change logs and I can see that you are committed to ensuring your malware remains as undetectable as possible. Um, the downside to that, of course, is we as researchers can follow up on that and learn what they're doing, right? Uh, if a new uh, browser update comes out that mitigates various collections, we can now track how long it takes for threat actors to respond to that, and we can see when that risk will increase. Um, overall, many of the families have taken a very public approach, though, because in the long run, it does allow them to kind of get that advertisement, maintain activity within the uh, forums and show that they are committed to their malware. So let's look at a couple examples, uh, and there's some really notable ones in which various updates and other notable events have, uh, have occurred in times where they suggest there may be impact on the log numbers. So in this case, all of the blue lines you're gonna see are uh, notable events or updates, um, and the red lines represent some type of notable event or update. Now in Raccoon, uh, in May of 2021, uh, it was exposed by researcher, it was revealed by researchers that uh, Raccoon had accidentally exposed its backend Elasticsearch system, which allowed researchers to go through and see a list of every infected device. Um, subsequently, after that was announced, we can see a slight decrease, um, a significant decrease actually, in the number of logs we were observing within um, Raccoon. And you can see it doesn't actually get back up to the limits it was prior to that breach for nearly four months. Um, and then the final line, of course, um, as you would expect, Raccoon has shut down its operations due to the ongoing uh, issues in Ukraine. Um, and as a result of that shutdown, they are no longer producing logs, uh, which is to be expected. 
Another interesting example is VIDAR. So VIDAR, as I said, doesn't provide updates on their uh, public forums uh, or within a public presence to a great degree. I think they have three or four small updates. However, they do have a, a single platform where users who are subscribed to the VIDAR malware can go log in and can collect uh, information about VIDAR and collect their stolen credentials. In this, uh, VIDAR does have a very robust change log that is incredibly detailed. And looking through those, uh, the red lines map uh, a number of updates. So in some of these more pressing updates, VIDAR doesn't provide much information. But what's very interesting, in nearly every single update that had the, sh uh, the phrase urgent replacement, emergency update, something of that line, we saw a very severe drop in logs following that. Now, when you think about what these updates are doing, they're likely addressing some type of problem in the malware. In some cases, they're related to protection bypasses. In other cases, they're related to collections. So it makes sense that after these emergency updates come out, we would see a slight drop in um, malware. Uh, and sorry, in the number of logs we're receiving because generally there's going to be a, lo a, a slight lag in between uh, these updates coming out and the uh, logs they're collecting. So in every one of these cases, we saw um, a significant drop. The only case where we uh, saw an actual significant rise was in update 40.2. Uh, VIDAR implemented some new protection bypasses. And uh, less than a month after that came out, we can see in the uh, last line on the right, we can see the log numbers significantly increase uh, after that. And then they drop following that. But uh, you know, there, there is potential value in these updates. Uh, last but not least, we want to talk about VIDAR. I mentioned before VIDAR is becoming incredibly popular, and it's used highly among the threat actor community from low, medium, and high-tier threat actors. Now, Redline does leverage a centralized panel uh, to a degree, and they also give uh, users uh, panels that they can set up themselves. And in a number of updates, uh, Redline, the Redline developer Glade made changes that ultimately changed how the client, the malware itself, would communicate with the server or the panel. And in those changes, it required a complete reworking of both the malware and the panel, such that they needed new panels entirely. Old malware wouldn't work. Uh, and when those occurred, we can see significant and notable drops in many of these situations. Um, so in update 18.1, uh, they come out and they say the old builds on the new panel will not work. New builds on the old panel won't work and actually uh, break it to a point where it's inoperable. New builds will only work with a new panel. And we see a significant drop after that. Similar for update 20.2, we see another drop. Update 21, we see it uh, kind of hits at the bottom and then goes back up. In update 21.3, we see a drop shortly thereafter. Um, when we consider what this means from a threat actor's perspective, it makes sense that we see significant drops, right? In order for threat actors to go and rebuild their panels, they have to go out, they have to obtain new infrastructure, they have to redistribute their uh, malware, and especially in like the update 18.1 where these updates, uh, old builds would actually cause damage to the panels, um, they essentially have to go through and completely restart their operations to ensure that the malware uh, that they're running is going to match the proper panel in place. And at any point, setting up a server, as anybody here knows, setting up a new server and making those quick uh, patches is always a rather stressful time, and it rarely, if ever, goes well the first time. Um, so these types of disruptions do, have, do appear to have potential impact on the number of logs that we're observing. Um, that being said, Redline is an incredibly effective stealer, so many threat actors are willing to kind of look past some of those issues. Um, so I want to wrap things up now. Uh, what can we really do to help prevent these attacks and help mitigate the risk of bot shops and information stealers? So targeted bot shop monitoring and calculated buys can help identify internal exposure uh, and identify high value compromises, right? Uh, there's a lot of organizations who will leverage their intel providers to look through these, or these different um, marketplaces and whatnot for potential references of inside leaks um, because those inside leaks have high value for damage. Uh, 
so following that, uh, given that a lot of the Stilo logs and the information coming from those logs are going to anti-detect browsers and are going to help commit fraud, um, tracking the changes that these malware make is incredibly important because it helps us to go through and better adapt the detection methods that we're using. Um, and finally, uh, understanding how these shops are growing and understanding what is happening to the malware and what, um, what malware are popular can better help uh, inform resource allocation. You know, just understanding the simple fact that it, you know, uh, last month raccoon steel went down, it's probably a really good time to start deallocating resources from raccoon detection and pushing them towards Redline, VIDAR, and other detections. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone here. Thank you to uh, BotConf. Uh, and if you have any questions, we're happy to take some now. And if we don't get to it, of course, feel free to reach out to us via the emails. Thank you. OK, we have time for a couple questions. Come on, guys. Vitaly, of course, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the talk, guys. Um, I have a question um, from your perspective. Uh, are criminal escrow services still part of the underground economy? Like, uh, how big is this? What do you see? Um, escrow services vary greatly to greatly from threat actor to threat actor. Uh, most threat actors will, most legitimate threat actors have no issue using them. Um, a lot of the stealer, uh, a lot within the stealer industry, uh, specifically like the malware itself, is cheap enough that many people won't consider using it. Um, that being said, on the automated shops that we discussed, Genesis, Russian Market, um, and the, the remaining ones, um, an escrow service isn't used there, but they do have generally very good customer support in place so that if there is an issue, usually you can reach out to the, the site operators and be like, hey, I bought this log, they were all dead, none of them worked. Uh, and nine out of 10 times, those, those administrators will work with you to either get you some money back or try to help you configure your tools so that they will work. Um, certainly though, when operating in kind of the peer-to-peer the -peer aspect that happens on many forums and in chat services, escrows are still regularly used. And just to add one flavor to that, um, automated escrows are starting to become more common too. So like XSS just opened up an automated, or Avtogarant, right? So it removes the middleman entirely and has the site handle the escrow for you. Um, and partially, right, I mean, when we're talking about the cloud services where you might be paying one, two, or $3,000 a month, um, in that case, escrow services are used regularly and um, by any reputable threat actor. So what's your opinion on this entire IT industry moving toward a more user privacy protecting uh, scheme? For example, like Apple is uh, rolling out a private relay to anonymize IP. The user agent is becoming truncated to only a few bytes of information. Uh, so on and so forth, pretty much all the fingerprints you generate out of the browser will be severely limited to a few bits eventually. So it will be an ideal world for all these malware stealers, right? You don't have any, need any sophisticated uh, to, to emulate the real user, right? I think uh, given enough time, these start actors have proved that they're conti they can continually adapt and always move to a way such that they can continue to commit this fraud. Um, what we will see, I, I believe, is you know the a slight kind of decrease in some of that and how successful fraud can be as uh, things become more anonymized and privatized. Um, you know that that addition of privacy is uh, a good thing in some ways, but also a bad thing in others. Uh, a lot of fraud detection systems now do rely on the ability to correlate information. Um, so I think there are many. I think what we'll see is kind of a move in what information is correlated. So maybe we can't use an IP, but we can use other aspects. Uh, and I think that's kind of where we will see a lot of those detection systems go in the long run. OK. No more questions? One, two, three. OK. Thank you very much. <laughs>